Okay, let's get started. Um, we're down to the last three weeks of the semester. Um, so I'm, my plan for the rest of the semester um, is fairly simple. I have a lecture today about talking about Kafka and Spark streaming. Um, I'm thinking about doing one more lecture next Tuesday um, on a slightly different topic in that you know, Python is a big player in data science, um, yet it's a very slow language. Um, and so I'm thinking of giving a talk about uh, Python versus Julia, uh, talk about language a little bit. Um, and other than that, um, so I'm some people had ideas on projects last week. Um, so this coming Thursday, again, I want people to show up and talk about the project I haven't already done so. Um, and I'm thinking then on next Tuesday, talking about languages and Python and Julia. Then after that, it'll be, um, I'll be here to talk about projects, but no formal lectures. Um, there are two main reasons for this. One is I need to get caught up in grading. I'm way, way behind. It's getting embarrassing. Um, and secondly, students tend to be somewhat busy at the end of the semester. I'll give you more time to work on projects here and other courses. Um, yeah, it's, I'm not sure I pronounce it A-K-K-A, -K -K -A, yeah. Oh, I'm trying to Google Yeah, no, it's spelled A-K-K-A. -K -K -A. Um, people, people use Zookeeper and ACA sort of a base to build in distributed systems. And we'll, you will, we'll see Zookeeper today's lecture. Any other questions? I will post some guidelines about what to turn in for your, for your projects. Um, you know, I've talked to a few students, some are struggling with ideas and how to make them work and what's gonna happen. Um, that's sort of expected, the problem with come up with ideas and what to do is, well, Alan Kay likes to say, most ideas are bad, that's why you need lots of them, right, to figure out. But it's also, like I said last time, I, or some time ago, you know, places like San Diego State tend to just give you, you know, here's what you're gonna do, here's your assignment, here's your assignment, just do this. Um, but it, we don't do a lot of, well, go find an idea that'll be interesting, right? Go find an idea that'll be interesting and work on it. Um, and that process is entirely different than here, go do this, right? Another question, see, yeah, let's look at last time, well, over a week ago, we we're talking about Kafka. Um, and Kafka is this, it's basically a messaging system, right? Where, you know, producers can produce messages and that can be anything from LT devices to businesses, I mean, all kinds of this, anything that produces data. Um, 
and then the consumers can actually read it, right? And we were in the middle of talking about the it's Kafka's performance. Um, and so the, the creator of Kafka did this experiment with this general purpose hardware. Um, and looking at output, you know, performance of uh, producers um, using three producers and replicating the data three times, um, they're able to get two million records pushed into, you know, pushed out um, in a second. And very high performance, right? Very. Um, and again, looking at the throughput, you know, Kafka, it just appends files. And appending files is pretty fast, right? You're not, it's just add things to the end, add things to the end. And so that um, the throughput did not matter how much, how much data they already had stored. Of course, at some point, once you fill a disk up, it, it crashes, but, um, a lot of good throughput. Um, consumers again can read. I mean, with three consumers reading the same topic, the topic being both replicated and have partitions, right? Um, again, reading an order of two million records per second. So it's fast, right? It's just fast, a lot of throughput. Um, and then also latency, um, how long it take for a message to go from a producer to a consumer, and the median was two milliseconds, right? Which actually, that's pretty impressive, right? Two milliseconds. Now, part of this is you have to keep in mind, um, well, I'll get, come to it later. Um, and then three milliseconds got 99% of the messages that time. And there's a few outliers, right? 14 milliseconds um, only got us 99.9%. So this kind of makes sense. Text message, visualizing it small for uh, is it used for file transfer? Um, is it used for file transfer? Just kind of like well, what's a small message? Um, you know, if you've got a gigabyte file, we're not going to use Kafka, right? This is basically for data collection. Um, it's used for, well, they started a link in, right? And they, had, they have all this, this different data sources. People were entering data. You're asking for things. Um, and there's just all this data floating around, and they did some way of managing it, right? So they weren't, they weren't slinging gigabytes at a time. It was just lots of little things. And you have a lot of devices also. That's one use case, yeah. Um, their use case is totally different because they didn't have devices, but they had lots of users, right? They were entering stuff. And, and it's also a Kafka is also used um, when you're building a distributed system, how do you communicate all the pieces together, right? Well, you could build your own communication system or you could just use Kafka, right? Right.
Also, also if you go to the Kafka website, um, they have a page about who uses it. There's a whole long list of them, but a few of them actually have links to um, reports on how they were using Kafka. I think New York, New York Times was one of them. Um, you know, so what makes it fast? Well, part of partitions, right? We can take a single topic, can have multiple partitions, and so when you're reading and writing to it, um, different servers can be writing to different partitions, and different clients can concurrently reading from different partitions, right? And partitions are run on different machines. So I can take a topic and I can break it into many partitions and that allows multiple machines to re read and write to that topic at the same time. We, we're not, we're not, Restricted by having a single topic um, only being on one machine, so that machine becomes a bottleneck, right? A, a single topic can span multiple machines. If two million records per second isn't good enough for you, then use six machines or ten machines for the same topic, right? Um, they also compress the messages to reduce the bandwidth. Um, and so when you create a message, you specify what sort of compression you want to use. And this is one place where Zookeeper comes in. Um, If you get a message, you're going to compress it. We need um, we do several things, right? Um, we put it in binary format, and we need to know how to unpack that binary format. And so, the, if your messages are, are simple strings or base types, then it's easy. We we just say that's a string, that's a string, that's a string. But if we have a, a complicated data structure, right? It's a record of some sort. Um, then have to the producer needs to use a some way of taking that data and put in binary format. The consumer needs to know what that schema is to unpack it, right? And now we can either add that schema to every message we send of that type, which is going to add lots of overhead, or we can take that. We can tell. Um, Zoo, running Zookeeper, um, look, this is for this topic, right? This topic uses this schema to pack and unpack. And then when the consumer reads it from that topic, it can just grab the schema from Zookeeper, not having to have every message have that schema <laughs> built into it. And then we can press it, right? Um, to make it as small as possible. Keeps the bandwidth down, makes it easier. Um, I think we probably got this last time where um, you know, it drives her fast. The OS is very, um, people have done a lot of work on the OS to make it IO fast, right? And they've always caches. Um, so what they do is they say, look, they've already done all the work, right? Um, and the problem is you're in Java land, and Java land, um, the overhead of objects is, I think it's like 48, I think the header for an object is 48 bytes for every op Java object. Um, and if you're dealing with 2 million records, and you're having 48 bytes overhead each one, to try and keep it in memory, it's going to be a lot of excess memory, and then when you get when you have too much memory, you have to worry about garbage collection and it's sort of slow. And so they said, no, forget it. You know, we're going to write everything to disk um, and we're going to use as little memory as possible. Why? Because we want the OS to cache it. Right? So as soon as the message comes in, first thing the server does is it writes a disk, it appends a file, right? So it goes into the OS cache. 
right. <coughs> now, part of this experiment, when they were putting a lot of messages through and then reading them, one reason it was so fast is because as the producers were writing the servers right, uh, and the consumers were trying to read it, um, the consumers were reading it from the cache. They, it was still in cache, right? So as long as um, consumers aren't that far behind the producers, they're going to get the data from the cache. Not ha you don't have to actually read it from the disk again. Which is highly non-intuitive, right? Most people, when they want fast response throughput, they keep everything in memory. You're there studying the operating system, keep it in cache, and you got a if you got a 30 gigabyte cache, I mean that holds a lot of data. Um, and then when you actually want to send the file. Um, When you're in Java land or almost any language, right? When you want to, when you want to send a file across the network, you have to read it from disk. But that requires you, right? You have to get the file off the disk and you put it into kernel space, right? And then you can copy it over to user space. So your program can access it. And the program says, okay, now I want to send it to. Now that I got the file. I want to send it to, right? This network, and so you have to copy it from user space again over to right kernel space to a socket buffer and then you can copy that socket buffer onto the, your um, output buffer for their network device where a send file on Linux does it directly you give it here's the file and here is the socket I'm going to send it to and it copies it directly and so we don't have this four stage copy on the copy of once and you're not going between user space and kernel space back and forth, right? Just... Um... So that's why Kafka is really, really fast. Um... When we're dealing with distributed systems, you have to worry about when you send a message, how do you know it gets, you know, there's always this problem because you send it, oh, something goes wrong, now what do you do? You resend it, how do you know, um, you know, the producer wants to send a message, so it sends it, then it crashes, and you bring it back up again, it doesn't know whether it was received or not, so you just, do you just forget about it, or you just send it twice, and so you might get it sent twice. Um, and how do you deal with that, right? Um, you know, so here, um, is it received when the first server gets it and the second, already wait until the second server gets it? Um, if you wait until all the replications get it, then there's a big delay, right? Um, so do you just, so when a leader gets it, you're done, or do you want to wait until all the partitions get it? Right. Um, so if something goes wrong, right, the producer doesn't know if it's delivered, if it goes down and it comes back up again. Um, prior to Kafka point 10, um, you'd have to resend it. You have no choice, right? Um, you know, it crashes, now what do we do? Well, when we come back, we don't know, so we resend it. So then you get you get message duplicated. Um, but in Kafka, um, 0.11, um, they introduced the item point delivery, and that is each producer has an ID, a UK ID, and when it sends a message, it sends a, a sequence number, right? And now, um, so from 
point eleven onward, we, we basically, you know, if we have, as its producer resends the same message with the same message sequence number, this Kafka server notices that and does not duplicate it. And so if something does go wrong, the producer crashes, it comes back up again, and resends it, the message that it didn't send, has sent before with the same sequence number, Kafka takes care of that and does not duplicate it. Which doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you don't, you know, disturb the system, it, it's one of those edge cases which drives you nuts because, okay, how do you know um, when the producer sends a message and doesn't get the response back whether um, it was received or not? And you have to deal with it. How do you deal with it? And they also added transactions. So we can have a bunch of messages, messages in a single transaction. Um, it may be that a particular type of message is relevant to different topics. Um, and you don't want, say, it's relevant to five topics. You don't want it to go to three topics and then fail on the fourth one. Um, so you could basically have a transaction saying I'm going to send them all, and either they all are received or not received. So you can re and the producer, when you create a message, you can specify, look, um, I want to know, tell me when the leader gets it and all the followers have the message, you know, when just a leader has it. Um, you can provide you can give a timeout so you know i'll wait this long for this message to come back otherwise forget about it or just i'm going to send it and i'm going to assume it gets there and i can worry about it and again the, the reason they do all these options is because sometimes not all a no option is appropriate for every single use case right You're using it as a system before gaming. Um, you probably want the last option because, like, it, we want it as fast as possible. And you know, if the packet gets dropped, we don't care because the game moves on. And you know, if you back things up, other uh, people are going to be shooting you, and you're dead anyway. So, um, if it's deal with money, you want to know, right? We really need to know um, that you received this message to do this transaction. And, Now there's two different things. One is replication. Um, and so you have a topic, a topic and replicate as many times as you want. So how many machines do you want to deal with that topic? Um, we can also divide a topic into multiple partitions. Those two things are orthogonal, right? I can have one topic and one machine, with, but have multiple partitions for that topic. I can also have um, each one of those partitions is replicated many, many times so that many clients, many servers can write into the same topic um, at the same time. It's not restricted to a topic, it's not restricted to a single machine, right? It can be. And each partition can have multiple copies, right? So when it goes down, Someone takes over. Now the problem is, what do they mean by when, when it goes down, right? Um, so when you write a message to the leader, right, it's going to then send it to all its followers. Um, the problem is, you want to know which followers are there, which ones are in sync, which ones are live, right? Um, so what, 
what they use, they call it in sync. Um, and by in sync, it means the follower can't be too far behind the leader. Um, and you specify how many milliseconds they can be behind the leader to be called in sync. And since these, these copies are different machines, and those, each machine is, is handling multiple different topics, multiple partitions, um, a particular machine could fall behind on a particular topic and partition because it's busy processing as a leader on, say, 50 topics, and some of those topics are very active. It may then fall behind um, as, a, as a follower on different topics, right? Um, and so they consider the failed node one, which is dot in sync. If it gets too far behind, then we'll, we'll assume it's failed. And and when a leader dies, what do they mean? Well, um, there's a special subset of followers which which are all caught up with the leader. Um, when a leader dies, then the, those followers then vote on which one's gonna become um, the new leader for that particular partition, right? And the zookeeper keeps track of, you know, each IRS set for each partition. So what's happening is um, Zookeeper has what's called a heartbeat. It's like, okay, every every so often it's gonna send, are you guys still there, are you still there, right? Um, and so it's always gathering information about all the nodes in your Kafka cluster. Um, and one thing that keeps track of is for each partition, who, which of the followers are still are up to date with the leader. And so when the leader goes down, the zookeeper knows who can vote, right? Decide who becomes a new leader. And so, yeah, when the, when the leader fails, um, people are caught up to vote. How do we know when a leader fails? Well, failure um, is basically like, I mean, you never know when the machine is down or it's not responding or it's slow, right? Um, so basically they, they define um, zookeeper sends his heartbeat out and when someone misses too many heartbeats, it's like, okay, they're off. We're just gonna assume they're no longer active and then, um, then we'll vote, right? So the zookeeper thing keeps track of who is responding to the heartbeat. And they only get so many heartbeats that you don't respond with, and then it considers that you're no longer active, you're, you've failed. Like I said, we can specify um, how to guarantee delivery, um, the producer can be notified when you want, what they want to know about it. And when you send a message, you specify um, basically three parameters, zero, one, or minus one, um, meaning all, and then so each message you can specify, I want to know, don't tell me anything, tell me when leader has it, tell me when all the arts, our predictions have it. So Zookeeper is this crazy thing. Um, the, the problem here is <clears throat> if you build a service system, you need, to, you need to configure it, right? And the problem with it is it's gonna be on multiple machines. So if you've got a system that runs on three machines, it's not, 
it's no big deal to log on each machine and copy the configuration file and edit the file and then do it that way, right? When your cluster has 50 machines, you probably don't want to log on to each of the 50 machines to modify a configuration file every time you want to change configuration, right? It's just going to be too painful. You want some central system to take care of your configuration for you. Um, and so people built a distributed system just to handle configurations for distributed systems. Why distributed system to do this? Because if you use one machine to do all this work for you, that becomes a point of failure for your class, for your distributed your system. So you want a distributed system so that if one of the zookeeper nodes goes down, another one can take over. Right? This is, um, so Zookeeper is used for Kafka, but it's also used in other distributed systems just to keep track of information about the distributed system. Um, no, no, this is, no, we're not, we're not, we're not configuring the operating system, we're configuring, it's information about Kafka, right? We've already seen it keeps track of well, it's doing a heartbeat to keep track of who is still there. It's um, keeping track of all the ISR nodes for each each partition and topic, right? It also keeps track of all this. If we're using a compound messaging data structure, it keeps track of that schema or actually the encoders and decoders so when consumers read one of those topics they have a central place to get it um you know so they do it for configuration service synchronizing well again synchronizing we don't want to just doing a heartbeat so each um also zookeeper over kafka keeps track of the topics so every time you create a new topic, you register with Zookeeper, um, so it knows what all topics are. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So there's so Zookeeper is a service system. Um, and so there's one one machine which is the leader, right? And it it's doing everything, right? Um, but then you have to replicate it. And this is replicated now. Once if all the Zookeeper <laughs> nodes are up to date, then clients can talk to, right? And so it gets really weird to think about because now you have a distributed system that's being used by other distributed systems to so all of a sudden right now if you want to run Kafka you also have to run a zookeeper system and apparently the um, when people are building distributed systems now, they will use Zookeeper um, for these services. Um, so you don't have to rebuild it. You don't have to rebuild this service for yourself. Now, for us, we're only it's only interesting because if you want to run Kafka, we're going to run Zookeeper. And so, if you actually want to run Kafka, um, the first thing you have to do is once you download it, um, it comes with uh, Zookeeper. And so there's a script to run Zookeeper. And there's um, some pre-configured 
configuration files for Zookeeper, um, which of course you have to edit for, right? Um, the, the ones you come with um, Kafka are pretty much designed for a single machine system, which doesn't make any sense. But the, um, so I'll first you start Zookeeper, and then you can start the Kafka server. And then if you want to create topics, um, right, there's, there's a, there's a sh shell script that we can run to create a topic. And we, we register it with Zookeeper, right, to know what topics there are. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't have to tell Kafka directly. And we tell it, you know, how, how many partitions do you want that topic to have? And how many replications do we want of each partition? And so we can configure, we can also configure the producers. So when they, when they send a, a message to Kafka, which has a new topic, Kafka automatically creates the topic. Um, there's a shell script to tell you, how, you know, list of topics. Um, you know, for testing purposes, there is a shell script to send topics to act as a um, basically a, a cheap producer and a command line producer, and there's also one for command line client. But again, this is it's just for testing, right? You're not going to do this by hand, but you really want to know your system's working. Um, and particularly when you're first starting with Kafka, it's nice to have something that this works, right? Um, you know, if you want to run, you can run a multi-broker cluster on a single machine. Again, it doesn't make much sense, but it's, it's again just to um, get up to speed on Kafka and see what's happening. Um, so we can copy the configuration files. Um, we create new topics. Um, and once we've done that, we can also ask for information about the topic, right? And it'll tell you for each topic, the partition count, replication factor. Um, it also tells you which nodes are, which nodes are leader, um, which ones are replicas, and you know the current ISR set, which we're in sync, right? So we get information about our our cluster, and we can do this in a, you know, if we had a real cluster instead of a, a fake one. Um, You know, each record you send, each you send to Kafka has a topic. The topic it goes to, it has a key and a value. Um, and these things are, I mean, they're serialized in the binary format and compressed. Um, and they have serializers for all the base types. Um, but if you you have a more complicated message you're sending as a value or as a key, you need to you know, tell the consumer how to unpack the thing. And you basically, the way you do that is you register that with um, Zookeeper. Now, if you actually want to produce a producer in code, right, um, it's pretty simple in the sense of, Here's pretty much all the method. There's a few other methods I didn't write down, um, but there's you know four messages on in the API for transactions. Um, there's a couple sends, um, and then there's you know a few um, constructors to create a producer.
all you're doing is sending messages, right? So you, you wouldn't expect the code to be very complicated. It's just send, send, send. Um, and do you want acknowledgement or not? And do you want a transaction or not? So writing producers is pretty straightforward. Um, here's a simple producer. And almost all the work is just configuring it. What do you want, right? Um, you know, where, which, which machine do you want to send it to? Um, acknowledgements, do you want all acknowledgements? Do you want, right? How many retries do you want to do if you can't do it? Um, remember Kafka for efficiency, it wants to batch up messages and do a batch and send them all at once. What's your batch size? Um, how much memory do you want to use a buffer for, for ins and outs? And then you need to see what serializer are you using, right? To um, serialize the key and the value. Um, and then you create a new producer given the properties. Um, and then we're just sending a bunch of stuff, right? So once you once you set the configure once you configured it, it just basically just send. So all the work is configuring it and worrying about how to serialize it. For a transaction, I mean, again, you, we need a properties file to configure it. Um, and then we have to initialize the transaction and begin, and, and then we get send, and we're done sending. Either we commit or we abort. So Kafka is, I mean, it's, there's more work in configuring Kafka than there is actually using it right it's all sending it up getting all the clusters together um but the producers and the consumers are i mean it's just it's basically send and receive right um So the question is, what happens if your network has, low, has high latency? Well, then it takes a while for a message to get there. And the consumer, again, is we need to configure it. And again, it's a lot of the same stuff. And then um, there's a polling message and how long to wait for the poll. And then we'll get a batch of messages. Um, and those records contain various types of information about what the key is, what the value is, what the offset is. And there's a few other methods we can we can use as a consumer to move the um, pointer in Kafka to where we last read. So we can go ahead or forward or rewind if we want. Now, the main reason to talk about Kafka in this context is because for Spark streaming. Like all of Spark, um, there's two versions of it. There's Spark streaming for RDDs, using RDDs, and there's Spark structure streaming, uh, it should not be RDDs, but it should be data frames, data sets, um, typo. Right, um, and like RDDs and that 
data sets and data frames, it's slightly different. Um, you know, for Spark streaming, there's a number of different types of input you can use. Kafka is one. Um, When we go to Spark structure streaming, there's basically um, only, it only supports three types of inputs. One is from a socket, and that's just for testing, right? The other one is Kafka, and the third one is for file. So basically, if you want to use Spark structure streaming, um, and you actually want to do streaming instead of just reading from a file, you use Kafka. So all your input is going to come from, come from Kafka. And the key thing about Spark streaming, whether it's Spark structure streaming or just Spark streaming, is the computation you do on RDDs or on data frames, data sets, is this, you do the same way you would do it if you were just reading from a file, right? There's no difference, which is pretty amazing because you normally when you do a streaming, you're like, okay, I'm gonna read this, and I'm gonna do something, and then I have to go back and read it again. And so the code you write has this big loop in it, right? You continually read this, process it, go read it again, like a, like a regular server. Um, you don't do that in Spark. You basically say, look, here's my input. It's going to be this Kafka stream, and I'm going to put it into this, R this, this data frame, and I'm going to do this computation on it, and then it, it runs a loop for you, and you specify how often you want the output to come out, and it's continually update the output for you. Boom, boom, boom. And what it, they say, I think about it is you have this, this input stream and you know a, a data set, an RDR is just a, like a table, right? And so they said, just think of this as an unbound table, but we don't have all, you don't have all the rows yet and they continually add in more and more rows. Um, um, as you add more rows, then the data set is going to, or data frame is going to then re, Read compute those operations on those new rows. So I, I stole this example from the documentation. Um, give an example of using Spark streaming, um, just a simple word count. And so the example is going to be, you know, time one we 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 send um, two two lines of, in our message, right? Um, then time two is one line, then time three these. Um, and we want to then count how many times each word, word appears. So here is um, the word count example. Again, I, I stole this from the documentation, although I modified it a bit because the documentation doesn't like they give an example, but they never tell you what things are, right? They say, val x equals this. And you go, what is x? I don't know. Um, they know because they use Spark all the time, but us newbies are like, how do I know what I can do with x? Because you don't tell me what it is. So I've you know, added, um, and so we're just create a Spark session, right? Nothing new. Um, from that Spark session, um, what's new is we can ask for a read stream, right? And we then have to specify, you know, where's the input. In this case, to make things simple, it's gonna come from a socket. So we can just open up a socket and type text at the socket. Um, then what machine, port number, um, and load. And that returns a data frame.
Next thing we want to do is, um, since we're inputting a line of text, right, um, we want to split that text into words. And so what we want to do is we want to then just do a, a split on the spacing and make a flat map, right? But the problem is, you know, it's a data frame. And so what's that column? Well, we won't, first we have to convert that column into a string. Um, and so there is this crazy as operation on data frames, which will then do that. But the weird thing is we get this import spark dot implicit dot underscore. Um, which was a little bit frustrating. Why? Because you go, where's that coming from? Oh, it's um, it's coming from the Spark Session, right? So you go to the Spark Session class and you don't see it. It's not in the documentation at all. It's not listed as in, what's the import. Um, so you can go to the source code and you will find it there. Um, but actually it turns out that the best information I found about what it is um, is just to leave that line out and compile the program and the error message tell you exactly what it's for. Um, what this is doing is it's importing the um, converters to, to convert the base types into, so I could put a string here, or an int, or a float, or a boolean um, to convert each column in that, um, actually th this one only has one column. Um, so we will only we'll convert that one column into a string type. If you want to push this out to a database, well, if, since this data is streaming in, uh, you're going to put it in a database. If you put it into a SQL database, we need to know, we have to create the table, right? So we need to know what, what structure our input is going to have. Well, if you're pulling in Twitter data, um, you still go to the, you're using a Twitter API to grab it, right? And the Twitter API tells you what the structure of the data you're getting. So you still need to have, know what the structure is, right? Um, and so those two lines are just basically um, the first one is to import the converter so I can put string there and that taking that one column in the um, data frame and, and convert it into a string type so we can do string operations on it and then I'm splitting it, right? Um, and then what I want to do is I want to um, Count how many times each word occurs, and so I'm doing a group by, and then a count, which is exactly what we would do if we we're just reading from a file, right? We would then want to partition things into um, split it into words, and then do a group by, and then do a count. Now, where it differs is well, um, we can then get a write stream out of it. Um, and there's, I'll put more of a type of this later. And then where we, where do we want to go? Do we want to go here to the console? We could do it to a coffee screen. We could do it to a file and then start. 
and then we call wait until termination, which means this program keeps on running until we terminate it, it can, to terminate in two ways. One is if an exception is raised, then it'll terminate, or you call um, query.stop. Yeah, so we need to talk about what this output looks like, right? Um, and again, there's um, different, there's, there's three different types. Um, so yeah, this, this input thing you know, includes encoders to do primitive types um, and case classes. So that's what this line is doing, it's basically saying, Give me the encoder so I can encode that column as a string. Um, there's three different types of output modes. One is complete, which um, you basically define a window and of how you know, when you want to compute this and how often you want to update the output. And complete means. Um, Every time you write the output, you write everything you've got, right? Which may not be what you want. So there is a pen. Um, so only new rows are pen are written out the output each time. And then there's well, it's not a pen. What is it? Oh, too many typos. Um, and no one which is only rows which are updated. The difference is there could be some new rows and some rows which old rows which were updated. But the examples they give, they always put the output mode in, in string, which drove me nuts because then it's like, how do you know what string it is? There's a another form where you can do output mode dot complete basically and then auto complete will tell you what the options are. So you don't have to remember, uh, is, it, is it complete with capital C or not? Um, then wait termination, the program runs until you either call stop on the query or exception occurs. So they're running their example. Right, so in time one, we get these messages. So your table of input is this, right? And then when you run run the query on it, you get there's one cat and there's three dogs, right? And so that's written to the output. This this table comes out. Um, time two, right? We input another message. So here is our input. Um, the query keeps this table, right? Um, and this table gets written to the output since we're writing, we said output is complete. And then time three, right, here's our input stream, right, on the table, a query produces this, and then that gets written to the output. When I ran the example, um, Right, here's, here's my input. I change it a little bit. And I'll explain the why in a minute. And then here is um, the outputs, batch one, batch two, and batch three. Now it happens, there's, there's two parameters. One is the window size, right? Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna compute things in a window and then how often do we output things? Um, so what happened around the example, when I did dog and all separate lines, um, often what's happening is I'll get a fourth batch because I was on the boundary point of the, of these output output, um, and so I'd get dog and batch three, and then all would occur in batch four.
Um, yeah, so I meant to delete this slide. Import sources. Like I said, there's only three of them. There's a you can read from file, you have a Kafka, and we can do um, sockets for. I'm not sure why they say it's only for testing, but how they know it's for testing. I mean, you just. So the question is, why do we need both, right? Um, the question is, how, question becomes, how do we connect? We have some of the data stream that's coming from someplace, right? How do we connect that stream up to Spark? Right. So Spark has to know how to process the data coming from your your data stream. Now, if we're doing the Spark streaming and that Spark structure streaming, they accept inputs from different types of data inputs, right? Um, the structure streaming, this is all, all they support. Now, once they support socket source, um, we could push anything we want on there, but then it's up to us to then four months of data once it gets into Spark. Now, if we want to do Spark structure streaming with Kafka, um, You know, the template we have for the read stream is, well, for us Kafka, um, we need to provide information about, um, you know, we're doing Kafka and we need to know where we can read the input from, right? Which machines? And then what topic? And then yes, remember, the first example of word count is coming from a network socket, and so it just knew about strings, right? Um, when it's coming from Kafka, we're getting a key and a value, right? So what it's doing, so what this is doing, it knows that, oh, it's Kafka, so each message has a key and a value, so it's creating two columns from us. One is called key and one is value. And then we have to then know how to cast that. Um, is each thing a string? Is each thing a number? Um, but we have to know how to, how, what type we're dealing with. Um, right? And then we can convert it. So here is um, basically the word count program, um, but this time reading from Kafka. Again, yeah, Spark session, um, read stream. Instead of doing it from a socket, we're doing it from Kafka. Um, on the lines. Um, since there are now more than one column, we only care about the we don't care about the keys, we only care about the values, and so we can you know get values of string and then as string, and then we just do the same thing, and then and again, there's there's no loop here. We're not you know say go and read this, read this, read this. It's just you know connect the input. Um, Convert to the right type for data frame, and then 
whatever actions and transformations you want to do on the data, and then we can write it out. Now things get interesting. Um, up to this point, we're just reading messages that come in. Um, but it may, often the messages you'll get will have a timestamp on it. Um, you know, if we're getting information from some device, you'll say, you know, here's a timestamp, here's one of those sent. Um, if you're getting transactions from a bank or, you know, some sort of um, ordering system, we'll have times when, when this thing was done. And then we can use that as event of the time of the event. The problem with that, the complication it adds is, um, some data sources might be slower than others, or there might be delays, and all of a sudden your data is going to come out of order. And you're now producing, you've got this window, I'm going to, here's my table for this window, here's my table for this window, and you're doing continuous updates. What happens when a piece of data is delayed, right? So they define uh, a window size and uh, how often you update the output. And so when you do a group by, you can add a window, um, give it the name of the column that you're going to use as a timestamp, and then the window size, how, how long you wait. And then, how often do you update the output? And everything else is the same. And so the example they give is, I want a window of 10 minutes, but I update the output every five minutes. Um, and so we start at noon, and we get a couple, we get a couple messages come in at various times, and then right here's our output at that time. Um, then another message five minutes later. Now what happens is, oh, we've got our output for the window from noon to ten. Um, we also have another window starting at five, and so we get two different outputs based upon those two different windows. And then at 12.15, um, we're getting the first window, right? Second window, and so we got one window starting here, two, three, so we get three different outputs for different windows. Now the fun part becomes when some data is late. Right, so this message um, was timestamped 204, so it should be in the first window, but it, it came, um, arrived here, right, really late. So what happens? Well, when we hit this, it's not there, right? So when you output, output this table, it's not included, right? When we come to the sec second five minutes, first window, second window, it's still not there. Um, but now when we hit the third window, right, it is here and Spark will go back and they'll say, look, okay, we've updated that table. The problem this causes is how long are, you, are we going to keep this table in memory, right? 
Um, do we want to keep it forever? I mean, if we're doing I mean, if we're doing this for weeks, right? We're just going to build up too much data. So there is what they call watermarking, and we can specify a time limit on how long we'll wait for data. And the data, so it's basically um, the watermark is if we say time ten minutes, ten minutes after the window has closed, we'll still accept data for that window. After that, if it comes in, it's, we'll just ignore it. You know, so basically, we can process a stream of data without too much work. We have to worry about what that means, so we don't have to continually have write a loop to read over and over again. We specify um, This is why you use Spark, uh, because Spark runs on a cluster, right? So we're, you know, so you add more machines to the cluster to keep up. You know, if we're running, if we're running things on a single machine, we don't need Spark, right? A lot of overhead. Just how to get things done. I mean, that's that's what Spark does, right? It it allows us to scale up the cluster to improve the throughput. And there are a few um, operations which don't make sense. Um, you know, so in Spark, we can say, give me the first n rows of a data frame. Let, I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And we're streaming because it's continually coming. Um, You know, count doesn't work directly. You have to do a, a group by. For reach doesn't work directly. You have to um, show doesn't work. So it gives you, you know, a little overview of Spark streaming, what it can do, how to do it. Um, So next time, um, we'll talk about project again. I'll send an email out to the class to tell people who didn't know what they were going to do last week, um, have a shot of talking about it. Any last minute questions? And hopefully, I'll get caught up in grading soon, but it'll probably take me a number of days.